Hi everyone, in this video I continue the discussion of the language of propositional logic. In particular, I'll talk about some more complex tra translations from English into the language of propositional logic. Here we'll focus on the following kinds of expressions. Expressions where there are multiple uses of and, like P and Q and R. Expressions where there are multiple uses of or, like P or Q or R. Neither P nor Q, not both P and Q, P only if Q, P even if Q. So let's get started. So sets of propositions connected by the truth functional use of the expression and or or can all be translated using multiple instances of the wedge or V respectively. So for example, if we wanted to translate P and Q and R or a sentence of the structure P or Q or R, like John is tall and Mary is happy and Frank is sweet, we could simply use the wedge operator multiple times with a letter for each one of the propositions we want to represent. We can put parentheses around the J and M or around the M and F. It won't matter with respect to the translation. In the case of I will go to the store or I will stay home or I will go to the party, this sentence has multiple uses of or and you can translate each using the V as follows. If S stands for I will go to the store, H stands for I will stay home, and P stands for I will go to the party. We can represent the whole sentence as S V H V P. Similarly, we could put the parentheses around the S and H rather than the H or P. In this case, it won't make a difference. One thing to note is that some propositions in English often don't make use of multiple uses of and. So we won't say John went to the store and he went home and he did this. Sometimes we'll use a comma instead and drop out some of those instances of and. This won't make a difference for how you translate it, whether the and is present or it's not present. So John is tall and Mary is happy and Frank is sweet gets translated as J and M and F or J wedge M wedge F. Similarly, the same sentence where one of the ands is dropped out and we have John is tall, Mary is happy, and Frank is sweet, we'll translate it the same way. Moving on to statements involving neither P nor Q. So some sentences or propositions in English have the structure neither P nor Q. These particular statements are true just in the case that P is false and Q is false. That neither of the two are the case. So we could express this in a different way by saying what it means to say something like neither P nor Q is to say that not P is true and not Q is true. So we can translate expressions of the form neither P nor Q as negation P wedge negation Q. So for example, if we had an expression John is neither happy nor angry, what we're saying here is, is that John is not happy and John is not angry. And so we can translate that with negations and the wedge. Similarly, if we said the stock market will neither go up nor down today, so for example, we're predicting that the stock market will stay the same or there won't be any movement, we might write not U wedge, not D. How about expressions like not both P and Q? So some propositions have the following form, not both P and Q. Propositions of this type, and it's important to note that they don't express the strong claim that not P and not Q is the case. This is expressed by neither P nor Q. What they express instead is that it's not both the case that P and Q are true. So you can think about this as saying that P and Q can't be true at the same time. One might be the case, the other might be the case, but they're both not the case. So one way to translate this or think about translating it is to say, is to notice that P and Q is true just in the case that both P and Q are true. And so to say that not both P and Q are the case is to negate this whole expression, to write not open parentheses P and Q close parentheses. So we can translate this as saying not P and Q, or if you prefer, you could say that it's not P or not Q. So for example, if we said that John is not both happy and angry, so we're, what we're saying here is that he could be one or the other, but what he definitely isn't is not both of these. We could write this as negation, open parentheses, H wedge, A, close parentheses. 
Similarly, if we said that John is happy or angry, but he's not both, we could write HVA to express John is happy or angry, and he's not both happy and angry. So we'd use the negation open parentheses H wedge A. So a discussion of not both takes us back to an earlier video where I talked about two senses of or. The first sense is the inclusive sense. This says P or Q, this expression is true if P is true or Q is true or they're both true at the same time. But there was another sense of or which was the exclusive sense. This sentence said that P is the case or Q is the case, but it implied that they're not both the case. So we saw that the inclusive sense of P or Q could be translated with the V. We could simply write P V Q if someone was expressing the inclusive sense of the or and uttering a sentence like P or Q. So what about the exclusive sense? Well, in an earlier video, I noted that there were two options. The first option is to introduce a whole new operator, this O plus operator, and to define the semantics of it as saying, well, this P O plus Q equals true, if and only if P is true or Q is true, but not when both of them are true at the same time. But I noted that there was a way to use the existing set of operators to express this exclusive sense of or. Now, the way to do this is to express an or statement, but tack on the additional statement of not both. So if someone said Kobe or Michael is the greatest basketball player, what they're saying is that one or the other is the greatest, but not both of them. So we could translate this by writing K or M, Kobe or Michael is the greatest, and not both. We saw that we could express not both by writing negation open parentheses k wedge m close parentheses. Next, some propositions have the form p only if q. These propositions express the case that p is not the case if q is not the case. In other words, they state not p if not q, which can also be expressed as if not q, then not p. So when someone says, P only if Q, what they're essentially asserting is that if not Q is the case, then not P is the case. Because P will only be there, or some proposition will be there if Q is there. And so if Q is not there, then P won't be there. So we can translate expressions of the form P only if Q as negation Q, right arrow, not P. So let's look at a quick example. So we might say, well, John will go to the party only if Mary goes. So what this is asserting is that if Mary does not go to the party, then John will not go to the party because he's only going to go to this party if Mary goes. And so we could translate this as not M for if Mary doesn't go to the party, then not J, and the not J stands for John will not go to the party. Or we might write John will be found guilty of a particular crime only if he committed the crime. And we could translate this as not C to, to express if John did not commit the crime, right arrow for then, not G for John will not be found guilty. Lastly, and I think this is the easiest one, some propositions have the form P even if Q. What these propositions say is that P will be the case regardless of the truth or falsity of Q. And so what this means, is, or what is being asserted here, is that P, even if Q, is simply saying P, independent of Q, so the truth or falsity of Q won't matter here. So we can simply translate what's being asserted. We can capture the conditions under which this is true by simply writing P. We can translate P, even if Q, as simply P. And so to look at an example, we might say John will go to the party even if Mary goes. Now it doesn't matter for the truth or falsity of the statement whether Mary does go to the party or she doesn't go to the party. All that will matter here is whether or not John goes to the party. And so we can translate John will go to the party even if Mary goes as simply stating P. Similarly, the stock market will go up even if no one buys stock. We can translate this as S for the stock market will go up. Well, that's all I have for the language of propositional logic at this point. 
In the set of videos we've looked at, I've talked about the language of propositional logic in terms of the symbols, syntax, semantics, and how to translate certain expressions from English into the language of propositional logic. For more resources, I, I encourage you to check out the following books. I've also found these books helpful in creating these videos and writing these slides.